Michelle, it seems to be eight o'clock. I think it's something we could start. Sounds good. Good evening, everyone. Uh, hopefully uh, you've had a chance to log on and uh, we're very excited setting scoliosis it's a straight uh, foundation, uh, uh, helps support the harm study group and discovering many new discoveries in spinal deformity. So we decided to get some of our experts together and uh, let you ask some questions. And uh, could I have the next slide? So I'm uh, Tom Errico and I'm happy to work with uh, my uh, co-chair, Dave Clemens. Uh, you can see that I'm in Florida and David is in New Jersey. Next. We have a great panel. Uh, Dr. Lahner uh, at, uh, from Mount Sinai. Uh, uh, Dr. Uh, uh, Farouz is not going to make it tonight, but his talk will be covered by Dr. Samdani. Uh, Dr. Sukhan Shah from uh, DuPont Institute in Wilmington, Delaware. Dr. Samdani from the Shriners in Philadelphia. Uh, it's a great panel of uh, experts. Uh, there's, there's an awful lot of knowledge between uh, uh, the, the four people on the screen right there. Dave, would you like some to take a look at the Brief instructions on uh, running the webinar. Uh, only the, the presenter's audio will be on, the one who will be speaking. Please mute all guest microphones. Questions submitted to the Zoom Q&A section. And answer questions will be posed to the presenters by the moderators in each after each topic. And a presenter can answer uh, questions based on the topic they just presented. At the end, we're gonna ask for uh, feedback to help us make these better. Next. Our agenda, uh, the, these are the talks that are gonna be given, three minute talks and uh, questions pertaining to each uh, topic uh, after the talk. Next. Um, Sending Scoliosis Straight is a nonprofit. Uh, our mission is to better discoveries and advanced techniques in treatment of spinal deformity in children's and adolescents. And our vision is a future where children with spinal deformities have the ability to live healthy, happy, and productive lives. Contributing to this uh, foundation helps to make those uh, missions and visions possible. Next. Great, David, Next thank you. Be Dr. Over. Erico. What to expect if you come to a doctor's office. Please make things easy for yourself and for uh, all the staff. Try and bring any copies of the imaging uh, on a CD and, and any physical copies of radiology reports in case you may have had uh, an MRI or a CAT scan or any studies like that. Uh, it, it, the typical expectation is that the office, oh, they were supposed to send it over. Don't trust them, that usually doesn't happen. So make sure you show up with them yourself. Next slide. Uh, I would suggest you look for a facility uh, that has one of the uh, new EOS machines. Uh, it's not just that you're going to get less radiation on the day of that visit, but uh, over the course of therapy for uh, scoliosis, sometimes uh, children need multiple x-rays. So, so this is a benefit down the road. Next slide. It's really not, uh, it, it's, it's a great machine. Patients just stand there. It's quick and easy. It's not claustrophobic for the, uh, your kids. And we get these full body images and they're just significantly less radiation for your child and a better quality image. What more could you ask for? Less radiation and better. Next. So what to expect? Well, if you can reassure your child and for yourself, if you have anxiety, uh, it's, it's a pediatric office and you're gonna see friendly staff, that's who goes to work there. And the nurses are friendly, the doctors are friendly, your kids aren't gonna get any needles, there's no bad tasting medicine. What you're gonna get is a lot of discussion. Uh, there's a lot of talking to healthcare providers who that's all they deal with is this type of problem. Next. Right, we're gonna, <laughs> there'll be a, you know, a brief physical examination, the last your child to bend forward, will be a neurological examination, a lot of questions about the development of the child. And, and then you start to talk about what type of scoliosis. Is this something that just sort of happened out of the blue? Uh, or has there been something that's been brewing in your child for a long time, like some type of congenital problem? Congenital problems are not that common, but they, they do happen. Next. 
And, and listen, I know you, you showed up with a lot of information from the internet and, uh, you know, this is a classic cartoon. I've already diagnosed myself with the internet. I'm only here for a second opinion. There's a lot of information on the internet. A very small fragment of that information is true. A very small fragment of the true information particular, pertains to any particular individual. So that's what the doctor's office is there for, to try and put that uh, all into perspective for you. Next. Listen, there's a lot of things out there. If it sounds too good to be true, it's probably too good to be true. And, 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 and as far as all these exercises, exercise is fantastic. You know, Arnold Schwarzenegger once said, great strength is never a weakness. So I could never argue with any, any form of treatment that tries to make uh, an adolescent uh, stronger. So I'm all for that. Uh, but just be wary of, of the internet. Next slide. When your child is an adult, you should talk about what's going to happen, the natural history, uh, the track record of, of, of established procedures, medicine learns from successes and failures over the decades. And uh, that's what you was going to be on the agenda to discuss with the uh, clinicians. Next. Anytime you do anything in life, you, you take your risks and you compare what the benefits are and you make an intelligent decision about how to proceed. And that's what you talk about with your uh, clinicians. Next. You know, uh, as, and usually offices are quite good about letting patients speak to uh, active patients who've had similar types of procedures, bracing, treatment, surgery, no treatment. Uh, this is one of Dr. Skagg's patients four years uh, uh, after her spinal fusion, and uh, uh, she was doing some pretty spectacular things. Next slide. First thing, don't worry. Don't be scared. Be prepared with the x-rays and report. Your, your, your visit will go great. Next slide. Thank you very much. David, any questions? I think we do. Um, do we have the next slide, please? So for some early questions, uh, Medea, what's the, Tom, what's the best treatment for a 14-year-old girl who has a very mild scoliosis, 15 degrees, but it uh, also has prater willi syndrome, a uh, problem with weak muscles and delayed development. Well, that's, that's interesting. Uh, I, I, just in my office hours this morning, I saw three patients with prater willi uh, two of them who were doing very well after surgery and another one who has a small curve. Normally, any 15-degree scoliosis, whether they have prater willi or not, you're just going to observe the patient. Uh, but with any type of syndrome, whether it's Brady Willie or anything else, you're going to have a keener eye looking at the x-ray and, and probably follow them for longer because sometimes uh, curves can, can develop a little later. So uh, expectant treatment, just watching and bring them back for follow-up. Thanks, Tom. The next slide. <clears throat> Another early question from Cynthia. Can uh, physiotherapy or gym correct scoliosis. I think you commented on this already, but it's probably worth uh, going over again. Well, uh, you know, there, there's different uh, types of therapy that people have the Schroth technique uh, and they claim correction of scoliosis. Uh, I, I don't know that I've seen fantastic scientific evidence that it works, but I think all clinicians have seen some patients. Uh, that have shown uh, some, some improvement. So once again, anything that you do that makes your spine stronger, how, how could you hate that? That's like not liking apple pie or motherhood. Uh, physical therapy is good, exercise is good. Uh, as long as it's not cost prohibitive. I mean, I, I've seen patients that have gone into debt and then still ended up needing a medical management uh, or surgical management of the scoliosis. And that's the worst of both worlds. Exercise good, too much cost bad. Next, from Jana. Schroth exercise. <laughs> if we kind of covered this. Uh, if it's, it's, if it's a little overwhelming, an 11 year old may not be mature enough to uh, really do it, uh, I would uh, stick with the other things that have been recommended. I mean, if it was, if it was a brace, I would use the brace faithfully. If it's just observant therapy, I would do that. But just because he can't concentrate to do the schroth doesn't mean exercise isn't good to incorporate into his daily routine. 
I mean, I, personally, I think swimming is, is a great exercise for older people that have back aches and younger people that have spinal deformities. It's just a, a, a great uh, exercise. Uh, so, uh, but any type of exercise, if they want to play soccer, let them play soccer, let them get out and be active. Activity is what the body was designed for. Good. Next, we have any more, any more questions? Nope. Looks like I'm up next. Uh, the role of genetics Thanks, and some common misconceptions. Thank you for Tom for those, uh, insights and what it's like to go to the office and the question. So next slide. Scoliosis is one of the most common conditions that affects children and adolescents. 10 million people in the US, it runs in families. Next. And here's a family that it runs in. And another one. Scoliosis is passed down through your family. It doesn't hit every generation. It may pop up uh, after skipping a few generations, but people with scoliosis are more likely to be related to each other than in the normal uh, population. Incomplete dominance means that it doesn't hit every generation. It doesn't hit everybody in the family. Polygenic means that there's probably a bunch of different genes that can cause the scoliosis and affect how severe it's gonna be when it does uh, appear. Next. Prognosis, meaning what's gonna happen is the central issue in uh, scoliosis care. And what's gonna happen really depends on a person's genes. You can have two people sh show up with that when they're 10 years old and have a similar looking curve in their spine when the effect is just starting. But one person's genes are going to make their spine bend like the patient on the bottom and the other person's genes are going to not do much at all. How do, you, how do we know which person it's going to be? We really don't have any predictive test at the moment to, to look at the genetics. We, certainly that's something we're working on. But right now, the only way we can do it is just by observing and see what happens. Next slide. Some common mis misconceptions and myths. Poor posture, uh, which is probably universal in teenagers, especially girls, doesn't cause scoliosis. It may lead to a different condition called kyphosis, which means you're sort of bent forward a little bit, but it's not, it doesn't cause scoliosis. Everyone with scoliosis will be deformed. No, you. I'd say 90% of the patients I have with scoliosis, nobody can tell except for their mom. And when they get to be adults, and I see adults, same thing. Most people hide their scoliosis very well. Backpack stones cause scoliosis. Heavy Carrying a heavy weight doesn't cause scoliosis. Carrying a heavy bag in one hand does not cause scoliosis. Diet and nutrition don't cause scoliosis, but are very important, meaning when you're a teenager, especially especially a teenage female, it's important to have a good diet. It has lots of calcium, vitamin D, and selenium. These are uh, things that are needed to build your bones so you can build them up until you get to be about 30, at which point everybody starts to lose bone. Next. As uh, Tom said, swimming doesn't not only doesn't cause scoliosis, it's actually good for your back. So swimming, it doesn't matter what stroke you do. Being in a pool is great for people who have want to keep their backs strong and flexible. Sports are recommended for everybody, but especially for uh, teenagers with scoliosis. It keeps you flexible, it keeps you in good shape, it keeps the weight off, and it makes you feel better about yourself. Can muscle development imbalance be treated with chiropractic care or exercise? Not really sure. Tom talked a little bit about therapy in this role, but there's no good evidence. However, uh, stretching your muscles and building your muscles with some lightweight training is not a bad thing. As uh, Tom's friend Arnold said, uh, good strength is never, not a weakness. Next. Scoliosis doesn't make you fragile. Don't hesitate to go out and play sports. Don't hesitate to get in, do contact sports. Sco having scoliosis won't ruin being able to participate in sports, sports, any kind of sport. It won't keep you from having fun and having hobbies with your friends. It won't change any your choices of having an occupation. So don't be afraid the scoliosis is gonna change your life in a negative fashion. It's not, It's gonna. you can have a normal life with scoliosis and you can even travel. Next next slide. So Tom, any, any questions from the audience? Uh, let's see, next slide, please. This is uh, just a paraphrase, but what about 
pain. Uh, many patients say, well, I have no pain. How could I have a problem? You know, it's, it's kind of funny. Most of the kids I see who have come into my office for the first time having had scoliosis discovered by their doctor, it's because they were complaining of some back pain. So the doctor got a, an x-ray and found scoliosis and sent them to see us. Scoliosis doesn't hurt. So usually it's another reason why they're having the back pain. Um, it's typically a muscular pain. And if you can treat the muscle pain with some stretching exercises and probably being more active, no, you don't have to be in pain. Scoliosis by itself doesn't hurt, especially if you're a teenager. Next. What about yoga? Uh, if you have an S-shaped curve. Uh, um, yoga is fantastic. The patient has no flexibility at all. Yoga is, uh, is a fantastic exercise for everybody. It doesn't matter how old you are. It's a great way to start keep getting your spine flexible and then continuing your, your spine flexibility you know, throughout your life. Even if you feel like you're stiff to start out with, working on the yoga can eventually get you much more flexible than you are. And if you do it correctly, you're not going to hurt yourself. It's just going to be a positive. So I, I encourage yoga with all my patients, no matter what their age, especially if you have scoliosis. Next slide. Um, this I think this is more of uh, an adult uh, question. I think we'll skip uh, over this. Uh, I think it's time for Dr. Lonner to give uh, a talk on predicting uh, curve projection. Baron, can you take Great. over? Thanks, Tom. Great to be with you all uh, today. Can uh, we go to the next slide? So who gets scoliosis and who needs treatment? Really, this is about progression of the curves, what curves get worse. And, and if a curve is uh, severe enough, it's going to require treatment. So we're talking about uh, adolescent scoliosis, idiopathic, uh, covering ages 10, so spanning ages 10 through 18 years. And if we look at all curves, so even small curves, 10 degrees or more, anything under 10 degrees, we don't consider significant. The, of the adolescent population, two to 3%. So two or three out of 100 uh, will have scoliosis. Um, and if we look at curves that may require treatment, 30 degrees or more, for example, it's one out of 10 of those patients. So it's far fewer of the patients. And then when we look at uh, girls versus boys, any curve, it's almost equal in terms of uh, girls to boy ratio. But when we look at curves that will require either bracing or surgery treatment, other than observation, it's almost 10 to one girls to boys. So they're affected more commonly and a very small percentage require surgery. Next slide. So why do we treat this? Why are we following patients? Why do we care about whether the curves progress? Um, and you, David uh, Clemens showed you the slide of, you know, that it's not always so easy to predict. And even with uh, our prediction uh, attempts, we can only do so in a way that re relies on the prediction of the amount of growth remaining. But why do we treat it? Health-related quality of life. So some patients, especially as they go through life um, uh, with uh, moderate curves or more severe curves, they'll develop pain and their curves can progress or get worse over time. And for the most severe curves that can cause breathing uh, difficulties. And of course, Nobody likes to see uh, asymmetry. You like, we like our hips and our shoulders to be symmetrical. And so with worsening curves, we can see changes in body shape. Next slide. So how do we predict which curves progress? There was at one point a genetic test, but it didn't pan out and turned out not to be effective for large populations. But really we look at growth and we can uh, determine that by age, but age alone doesn't really tell us about the skeletal maturity or the amount of growth remaining. We look at uh, menarche when the uh, girl had the onset of her period. So we know growth stops roughly one and a half to two years following the onset of the girl's periods. We can look at the Risser sign, which I'll show you in a moment, and skeletal age uh, predictions using the left hand x-ray. Uh, girls mature sooner than boys. We can look at body development as well. And some curves are more likely to progress particularly more severe curves than smaller ones. Next slide. So 
what, when does the curve get worse? It's called the cap, the curve acceleration phase. And before that period, and that, that's during what we call peak height velocity. So the curves get worse potentially during that peak height velocity, the adolescent growth spurt. Um, and we can predict that based on various um, markers that we take on x-rays. So various indicators of skeletal maturity, which I'll show you in a moment. But during the curve acceleration phase, uh, the curve can uh, progress or worsen by one to two degrees per month. Before that, it's, it's much less. It's less than one degree per month. We can go to the next slide. So you can see from here that girls are in their, their growth spurt uh, just around the age of 12 or even sooner than that. And boys are about two years later, about age 14 to, to 15. So they, they, we, watch, we follow the boys a little further along uh, in terms of their skeleton, their uh, chronological age. Next slide. And uh, the Risser sign is one that we've used uh, historically for, for many, many years and decades, uh, but it's not as reliable a, a marker of uh, growth remaining, but it, it can provide some value. And there's an old study that shows if you are a Risser grade zero or one, so a younger patient with more growth and they have a curvature of 20 degrees or more, almost 70% of those patients will have worsening in their curves. So we're gonna follow those patients with larger curves with more growth remaining very closely because they may go on to have more severe curves that require either brace or surgery. Next slide. And uh, you know the hand x-ray and we take a left hand x-ray and we can get a bone age from that using this atlas that has basically pictures of hands from boys and girls uh, and we can determine their, their bone age. But if we go to the next slide, there's a classification, a staging system called Sanders staging. And that gives us a very specific uh, uh, stage of uh, the patient in terms of their growth. And so stage three is when that cap or the curve acceleration occurs. So we look at left-hand x-rays to make judgments on timing for bracing uh, and uh, surgery such as with um, the tether, which you'll hear about a little later. Next slide. And we have another um, skeletal marker as well. And we look at the shoulder, it's uh, the proximal humerus is the shoulder bone. And uh, there are, are markers that we can use and landmarks that we use to determine the relative growth remaining for the patient. Uh, next slide. So predicting uh, curve progression, we can't, we're not too precise. We don't have a crystal ball but we know that we uh, have to rely on the amount of growth the patient has. And while they're growing, even with small curves, there's some potential for pro progression or worsening of the curve. So we'll look at their uh, skeletal uh, maturity indicators, their uh, menstrual status, Risser sign, and the curve size and follow our patients closely. So thank you. Any questions, Dave? Aaron, you ready for some questions? I am. First one from Foz. My son is seven years old. He has scoliosis of a very high degree. What, what can we do to help get him into a place where he can hopefully get some help with this? Do you know any places where perhaps people who don't have, don't have insurance can get surgery? Uh, I, you know, I think there may be some hospitals that uh, do uh, offer that, and uh, perhaps uh, Dr. Samdani can speak to that, whether his institution does. I can say that uh, for a seven-year-old with a curve uh, that's uh, severe, it, sometimes we treat those curves with bracing, sometimes with casting, uh, but some patients with larger curves do need surgery, and usually it's a surgery that preserves growth, and there are different options. Um, and so, I would suggest uh, following through first with your pediatrician locally to find out if there's a center, a, a hospital near you that does offer um, grants or uh, options for emergency care. Next slide. From Cynthia, uh, I have pain with sitting for long periods of time and it's caused me to have to stop working. Do you have any advice for somebody who has pain with uh, in their back from a probably with scoliosis? Yeah, so um, a lot of times the pain associated with scoliosis is related to prolonged sitting or standing or doing activities and it's relieved by lying down. I think uh, as you have said, Dave and, and Tom, 
keeping your core strong is the most important thing. I find that patients who get their backs into shape, I, I love swimming myself. And I think swimming, yoga, Pilates, those sor sorts of uh, activities are very good to keep the core strong and may help. And also keeping your weight uh, where, where it should be, uh, not too overweight. And sometimes sitting for prolonged periods of time is uh, causes pain when there's a disc problem. So it has to be uh, sorted out. If this is a adolescent patient, it's most likely related to scoliosis. Next slide. Good advice, Baron. Sylvia asks, so she, she's an older patient in a 40 degree curve. Um, is there anything that she needs to do or should she be concerned about this 40 degree curve at her age? So Sylvia is a big kid. And um, I would say for Sylvia, uh, most importantly, keep your bone health as, as good as it can be. Calcium, vitamin D, exercise, keep your core strong. Um, if a curve wants to get worse, it's going to get worse. And that's often related to wear and tear of the discs of the spine. But uh, as long as you live as healthy a lifestyle as you can uh, and do those things, that can be helpful. Keeping the core strong, again, getting into a swimming pool for uh, classes, even using flotation devices. And in some occasional cases, when I have a, an 83-year-old with back pain, we'll, we'll use a light 3D printed brace that can provide a little support, particularly for a lot of activities. And sometimes that does a trick if it's tolerated. Nice. Next. From Omolara, are there physical signs to, to know if the curve may be getting worse? Actually, there, there are. Um, you know, when there's a subtle worsening of the curve, we, we don't really see that. But if your child's shoulders are becoming asymmetric. So one shoulder's up and the other down. Uh, if the waistline is changing, there's a shift of the body to one side or another. Um, if your uh, child, your, your uh, uh, adolescent child bends forward, it's called the Adams forward bend test. You can even look that up online. Uh, there'll be uh, one shoulder blade will be higher than the other uh, or the in the lumbar lower spine, it'll be more elevated than the other side. So you'll see that. And if you're, if you have a, a daughter um, and you can look at her from the back, if she's wearing a bathing suit uh, or a bra, you can see an asymmetry where the bra strap is not uh, laying on her shoulders and her back symmetrically. So those are some of the things to look for. Thank you. Next. Any more questions? Next, uh, next slide. Oh, so kind of, this is another adult patient, someone who had surgery, um, 10 months ago, feeling numb around the area of the surgery. Is it common after surgery to feel numb in the very, area of It is, Dave. Uh, it's very common. There are, are uh, microscopic nerves in the skin. They're called cutaneous nerves, and we, we certainly don't see them as surgeons. And most of the time, the sensation, the feeling around the incision returns, uh, I would say, the vast majority of times. But you may have some small areas of patchy numbness that never quite gets better, but I've never seen that be a problem that causes any uh, lack of function or uh, disability. So I think most of that will improve uh, uh, over the months uh, following surgery to a year or even late, uh, even to two years following surgery. Good to know. Next, next slide. So now we're gonna move on to our talking about bracing. Um, Dr. Samdani has very graciously agreed to fill in for Dr. Bianchi, who is called back into surgery at his hospital. Um, Dr. Samdani is a great colleague and one of the uh, experts in the United States on scoliosis treatment in kids. And he's going to take over and give this talk for Dr. Bianchi. Dr. Samdani. Great. Uh, thank you, Dave, Tom, and some fantastic talks there. Please keep uh, putting in the questions in the chat, and we'll do our best to keep answering them. Next slide, please. So, you know, we recognize that there's a continuum of care for kids that have curves in their back. The smaller curves, i.e. curves that are less than 20 degrees or so, can oftentimes be watched or be prescribed some form of uh, physical therapy. Then the other extreme is the surgical patient, i.e. the patient that has a curve closer to 50 degrees. But what about the, kid, what about the patients that are in the middle? For those patients, those are the patients that we will often consider bracing. Next, next slide. Next slide, please. 
we may be having a technical issue moving the slides, but essentially, you know, it's interesting when you look at bracing, uh, there's been uh, up until 2013 when there was a landmark study done. Up until that point, it was really unknown if bracing even had an effect on a child's scoliosis. So our government spends $10 million, funds this large trial that gets published in one of our most prestigious journals, which really shows that bracing can actually prevent uh, surgery and actually control curvatures. Essentially for every three kids that were in that trial that were treated, we were able to uh, avoid surgery in, uh, in, two of the, in two out of the three kids that, that were treated. In addition, we have to think about bracing and who is bracing most commonly indicated for. And we look at two different factors. You wanna look at how big the curve is, and you also wanna look at how much growth the child has left. And Baron and, uh, has already done a really nice job looking at how we predict how much growth there is. You know, there's radiographic X-ray markers, whether it's a hand X-ray, whether it's your wrist or sign over your hips, whether it's your shoulder, <laughs> elbow, a lot of different markers that we can look at. But essentially, if a child is growing and has a curvature that's between 20 and 40 degrees, that's the child that's going to be most uh, uh, suited for bracing protocols. With respect to bracing, there's a lot of different treatment types of braces that are out there. The key things to note are you want to wear a brace that's number one going to get correction in the curvature, right? If my child's going to be wearing a brace for 16 hours a day, I want to make sure that that brace is doing what it's supposed to be doing. And typically we'd like to see at least 50% of correction in brace to make sure that the brace is actually working. It looks like we may have our slides working again. We can, uh, we can jump ahead. Yeah, it looks, looks like we're stalling there. So I will, I will keep going. So essentially uh, the key points are when we think about bracing, we wanna make sure that it's the right curve magnitude, that there's growth left, and then we get our child, that our child can actually wear the brace. How often do you need to wear the brace or for how long? Our studies would suggest that you wanna at least get our kids in the brace for 13 hours per day. I actually allow our children to wear the braces at night uh, to count as part of those uh, 13 hours uh, because we recognize that there are challenges when we're bracing our children. We can go ahead and jump ahead a bit Next slide, next slide, next slide, next slide. Great, right there. So that's, the, that's what I'm talking about when I talk about correction in the brace. Once the brace is on, we will typically recommend getting an in-brace x-ray to really make sure, and you may not always be able to get it straight, but you wanna see close to 50% of correction, which you often will, because these curves will be flexible. Next slide. Here's uh, the curve, uh, the study showing the 13 hours a day at a minimum to really get benefit. Next slide. And again, the types of braces, there's a lot of different types. You want to work with an orthotist to make sure that they really custom make it so it fits and it's as comfortable as can be. We know it's not going to be easy, but there's things that the orthotist can do. Uh, modifications can be made to really make it comfortable. Next slide. So in summary, bracing is for modest curves, i.e. curves up to 40 degrees and growing kids. You have to get a child to be able to wear it. Compliance is gonna be directly related to efficacy. If the child's gonna be wearing it, it's our job to make sure the brace is doing what it's supposed to do. And you really wanna work with an orthotist to optimize your brace. Thank you. That's great. Could we, uh, next slide. So are there any non-invasive or semi-invasive ways to correct the 38 degree in a young uh, female adult? So 20, 20 year olds, what do you think? So, you know, the first question is what's really the goal of correction? Is there, is it just the curve itself or is there some physical manifestation? Because a 38 degree curvature, there's many people around the world that are walking around with curves in that magnitude that it's not causing them any harm, i.e. no uh, compression on any of their internal organs, no pain. I do think, you know, Tom, much like you said, and Barron's touched on this as well, having a good strong core, doing uh, Pilates, uh, doing, you know, core strengthening, swimming, 
those are the exercises that in my opinion would help prevent any issues arising from a 38 degree curvature. Um, next slide. Well, this is about, are, are there ways to fix scoliosis without surgery? So bracing is one way. Uh, Samir, what, what, how, how would you answer this? So, I'm here. Right. Yeah, no, of course, Tom. So, you know, when we think about fixing scoliosis, are we, you know, there's two different ways that I, I read that. One is, can we get the curve to decrease without surgery? And the general answer to that is probably not. Maybe in really small curvatures with some, uh, you know, aggressive bracing in a growing child, you may be able to get some correction, but generally you're not going to get correction of a curvature. The other, you know, realm is much more important is, you know, what is that scope? What's that curvature doing? Is it causing any problems, i.e. pain or imbalance in the body? And is there any way to fix those manifestations of the curvature? And again, it's going to go back to, you know, uh, making sure that we give ourselves the best alignment through, through uh, optimizing our core strength and our physical therapy for scoliosis. Next slide. So we, we get a lot of questions about Schroth. Um, if someone's 17, and uh, obviously it depends on the curve magnitude, but, but but let's say someone has a 43 degree curve, 17 years old, and they failed the Boston type bracing, uh, should they continue the Schroth technique, which they were obviously doing along the way? Yeah, so you know, Tom, I think this is an area where our understanding is really evolving. Our main scoliosis society, the Scoliosis Research Study is actually funded research on scoliosis specific exercises, I believe specifically Schroth as well, to better understand and answer that question. My general um, you know, approach is it's unlikely to cause any harm. It's likely to, it may have some improvement it's unlikely to cause harm. And I encourage my patients to do some sort of exercise in those patients that have these curves that are not surgical uh, and they, but they have either failed bracing or continue to progress slowly. Next slide. I, you know, I think we've had, uh, can, can we go to the next talk? We've really had uh, a fair amount of, of questions here. Dr. Shah, could you take over and talk to us about surgical correction? Sure, Tom. Well, thanks very much. It's a pleasure to be with you. Next. You know, I think scoliosis surgery is probably a pretty scary topic for many adolescents and their families, but we have some current standards for, for what surgery, what kind of curve surgery should be recommended for. We typically think that because curves can be progressive even after you're done growing, if they're 50 degrees or more, those are the curves that we recommend surgery for, specifically a spinal fusion. Well, what are the goals of surgery? Number one, we wanna stop progression of that curve so it doesn't affect you later in life. We wanna correct the curve safely so you can have a balanced spine, balanced posture, and protect those areas of the spine that are not curved from curving later. And we wanna do this surgery safely. Try and lose little blood, certainly keep your neurologic system working, and enable you to return to all the activities that you love to do. Next. So how do we do it? Currently, the best procedure is through the back muscles. We move the muscles out of the way after a small skin incision that's very thin. We take out the movable parts of the spine so that the spine can become straighter. We put implants in that attach to the spine and then connect to rods that straighten the spine. And then we roughen up the bones so the spine and bone melds together. This makes a very durable, long-lasting operation that has an excellent track record for success and safety, even up to 30 years, 40 years later. These are just pictures of the way the rods look in a picture and a diagram, and then in surgery after the spine is corrected. Next. So how is it done? Well, most of the time it is done posteriorly. Sometimes we can do it through the front, through small incisions through the chest. We're really focused on doing the minimum number of fusion levels possible to maintain motion, minimize bleeding, muscle scarring, and injury to the nerves. Those screws that I showed you earlier are the ones that connect to the rod to make it straight. And the hospital stays have gotten shorter and shorter. Currently, most of us will discharge our patients in two to three days with two to three weeks out of school and then resuming most, if not all activities by three months. 
So we typically go by the 333 rule and you can ask your doctor about their specific recommendations after your surgery. Next. This is what a typical patient who's going to have surgery might look like on x-ray. You can see the large curve with the trunk shifted over and the shoulders uneven. But in the side view and the forward bend view, we can see that the spine is very rotated. Next. This is what the, the patient looks like after surgery. So those are the x-ray appearance of the rods and the screws that I showed you earlier. And this spine is very well corrected. The patient did extremely well and was back to school in less than a month and cleared for sports shortly after that. Um, this is very rigid instrumentation, meaning it's very strong, it's fixed to the bone. And after the muscles are healed, you can move pretty normally. People barely notice that many people months after surgery have even had this type of surgery because they move so well. Next. These are three-dimensional x-rays. I, I told you that scoliosis is a three-dimensional problem and we saw examples of that earlier. Well, this is how curved the spine will look from the top down view, the side view. Next. After surgery, you see all of these curves are straightened out. That's why instrumentation has become so important in correction and we can do this very safely now. Next. So what happens after surgery? You're in the hospital. Most of us uh, aspire to a rapid recovery pathway with limited use of narcotics and early physical act uh, activity. This is how we get patients out of the hospital sooner and you can recover at home. You can participate in light housework at home, return to normal activities, return to school and cleared for light sports and then eventually contact sports later. Next. I think most people are impressed by this early uh, activity and 95% of patients are very happy with their outcome. We have a very low reoperation rate and our 20 to 30 year follow-up studies show that patients are performing extremely well and are very healthy after surgery. They rarely think about their backs, but we have to compare that to what? You can't have scoliosis that's very severe and have surgery and be expected to perform just like someone who never had scoliosis to begin with you're gonna be so much better off having surgery than if you did not have surgery for your severe curve. That's the real comparison. People who have had surgery versus those who have not and might be very unhappy, debilitated and in pain as adults with severe scoliosis. Next. So the, today's techniques are really important for patients because we've gotten better, we've gotten safer and we're now providing real quality and safety and value and even uh, less radiation to our patients than they were experiencing in the past. Technology is moving forward so quickly that um, we are very happy to, to hand off some of the safety to our patients as well. Next. There's a lot of misconceptions and we've done a lot of myth busting tonight. Surgery doesn't have to wait until you're done growing. It does perhaps have to wait until a special time that most growth is over, but certainly not until you're completely done. It won't always be painful. Right after surgery is painful, but your doctor will help you through that recovery. The curve won't come back if the surgery is done well and you heal uneventfully. The implant should not be taken out later, only in very, very certain rare circumstances. Additional surgery is inevitable. I would disagree with that. I think if you take care of your back, keep your weight uh, down and stay active, many patients can um, go the rest of their lives with only one surgery. You are able to have children the normal way and you should advocate for your birth plan the way you'd like it to be, even including epidural anesthesia. You will be able to travel and you should choose an active lifestyle and maintain motion and fitness throughout your life for the best back health possible. Next. So that was a quick summary of scoliosis surgery with fusion. I think we have some questions, David. Yep. Uh, next slide, please. So Madison would like to know, um, she apparently had uh, a, a spinal tumor when she was seven and had three surgeries um, associated with the tumor. So this is not a typical scoliosis. Um, unfortunately, scoliosis became more prevalent. Um, sounds like she started out with a pretty bad problem and had some fusion for the, for the tumor and for the scoliosis, but her lumbar spine has gotten significantly worse. This is kind of a tough problem to diagnose just with a, a spot question like this. Any general suggestions? Well, it sounds like she's older now. She's probably a young adult judging from surgery 13 years ago. Um, and so that that lumbar curve has gotten bigger and stiffer and you're not able to do normal activities and the pain's interfering with your life, I would suggest that you see someone who does um, treatment for adults with scoliosis and they usually hang out in large academic centers in big cities. Uh, these are surgeons who are quite talented with treating adults with scoliosis. 
Um, you may also wanna reach out to the surgeon who did your original surgery and see if they can recommend someone you can see or they're willing to see uh, you again. Thank you. Next slide. How straight can you get a 79 degree curve, Sukin? Well, judging from our, the long-term data in our database, um, our typical correction is about 70 to 75%, but it differs for different curve types. Sometimes we wanna intentionally leave a little bit of curve behind. Sometimes we intentionally want to uh, correct the scoliosis fully. It really depends on safety, flexibility, and how big the curve is to start, and what other techniques your surgeon's willing to employ to get the spine straighter. But in general, I would expect that even large rigid curves can be well corrected to achieve spinal balance. And what I say to patients and families is that after surgery, your, your daughter may look like someone who didn't have scoliosis before um, when they're looking. No one's wearing their x-rays on a t-shirt, um, but if they look normal with their shoulders uh, nice and straight and their back well corrected, it will be like they never had scoliosis before. Right after the surgery, can you lie on your back or does it, does it hurt to lay on your back? Well, you pretty much have to lay on your back immediately after surgery during the recovery process, but we turn the patients quite frequently every couple of hours with um, our very talented nurses. We tend to get the patients out of bed very quickly the first day after surgery. And so you can lay however you want to lay. You can lay on your side. You can even lay on your front. Um, and that's completely up to you. The implants are very stable and your surgeon really shouldn't have any requirements about laying in a certain way. And then later, whenever it's all healed, does it, do you feel anything when you lie on your back? No, the implants are designed to be low profile. That means they're not going to be prominent or sticking out of your back unless you're extremely, extremely thin or there's been a problem after surgery where something may have happened. Next slide, good answer. Can you get pregnant and, be, uh, and have a child? I think you mentioned that, we went over that already. Um, sounds like that's really not an issue, right? No, um, and we have pretty good data showing that patients who've had scoliosis surgery do go on to motherhood, uh, sometimes with multiple children. I would advocate that your children do get checked for scoliosis, but you can have no children in the normal way. You can even have epidural anesthesia. Uh, we showed a higher uh, incidence of cesarean section, but I think that was because their doctors recommended it rather than uh, them proceeding not through the delivery the normal way. And so it doesn't really affect the scoliosis outcome. You can have a normal delivery just like anyone else. Correct. And if you haven't had surgery and you have scoliosis, I don't think that curves progress during pregnancy. There was a myth that that happened, uh, but we showed that wasn't true either. Next slide. The next uh, presenter is the, again, Dr. Samdani. Uh, that, and he's going to talk about tethering, once one of the new interesting techniques to treat scoliosis without fusion. Dr. Samdani. Thank you, David. Um, Sukin's done a great job. Uh, next slide, please. Sukin's already covered spinal fusion uh, very nicely and how we're able to get very reliable, consistent results using a combination of either titanium, cobalt, some centers may use stainless steel, but regardless, essentially we're setting the spine in a straighter position, allowing the bones to fuse or heal around it. Next slide. And here's just a uh, picture of what that healing around the bone would look like with, uh, with bone graft. Next slide. And the results of uh, spinal fusion are overall excellent. I mean, there's been a tremendous improvements in safety and efficacy. Here's an area which I think gets uh, misrepresented uh, on the internet, perhaps with some of the older technologies that were utilized today, particularly over the last 15 to 20 years, we have made vast improvements in really improving the safety, the efficacy, the overall outcomes of spinal fusion. Next slide. Next slide. And these can have you know, dramatic impacts on, on our patients. Next slide. But we have to keep looking at ways and innovating ways where we can improve our outcomes for a select group of patients. So although fusion works very well, and you saw that last patient that we had, but now you've got a set of screws and rods running up and down the spine, which is gonna cause the spine to be stiffer. So is there a way for us to maintain flexibility in a select group of patients prior to their curves getting so large that they have to have a fusion? 
So in patients that are perhaps still growing with moderate curves, can we control the curves by inhibiting growth on the longer side of that curve, that convexity, allowing the other side to catch up? And vertebral body tethering offers that option for a select group of patients. It, uh, in 2019, August, uh, received a limited FDA approval. And essentially, if I was to put it in a, in a summary statement, you're really trying to preserve flexibility, but you're losing reliability because when you have a stiff rod, you're gonna have a reliable result. When you have a flexible tether, there's gonna be some unpredictability in those patients. And because these patients are growing and because there's unpredictability, without a doubt, your chances of needing a reoperation are gonna be higher. Next slide. So who is really ideally suited for this uh, procedure? <laughs> Generally, uh, most of us who do this would say it's a growth modulation procedure and hence you need some degree of growth. And that can be for girls anywhere between 11 to 13 years of age. Boys grow a little bit longer, so perhaps you can treat them when they're a little longer. We can again go back to those growth predictors. None of these uh, which are really uh, optimized, uh, but they can give us some indication of how much growth there is. And then again, the size of the curvature, the larger curvatures are not gonna be treated with a flexible uh, rope, i.e. curves, once they get past about 65, 70 degrees, you probably need the fusion. And of course, whenever we think of patients with curves in their back, we think of the magnitude of their curve, but equally as importantly, how flexible is the curve? So the curve has to be flexible in order to be a candidate for this technology. Next slide. Next slide. So here's uh, work that uh, Dr. Peter uh, Newton, the president of uh, Setting Sorolia Straight Foundation has done showing that uh, you can actually harness growth. And in three dimensions, you can see sequentially, this is a set of x-rays over three years, and you can see that uh, sequential correction over time. And uh, Dr. Newton has done a lot of work showing that this correction occurs in three dimensions. Next slide. And uh, here's just an example of one uh, patient that we had. So here's a patient that has a lower curvature, a curvature that was in their uh, thoracic and lumbar region. And it's that really that lumbar region where trying to preserve mobility becomes very paramount. And when we've done studies in our motion analysis laboratory, comparing patients that have had fusions in their lower lumbar spine compared to patients such as this patient here who've had a tether, we've shown a lot of difference in how much motion uh, the tether can preserve. Whereas patients that have higher fusions in the thoracic spine, that difference really is not that great. Next slide. Next slide. So, you know, a future with motion is coming. I mean, obviously there's a lot of leaders in uh, spinal uh, surgery here, many of whom have brought in newer technologies over their careers and a, a future for uh, motion uh, and treating patients with curves is definitely coming. We are working very actively with our industry partners, with the FDA, with patient advocacy groups to make sure we can get their responsibility. Great. Um, we have the next slide. Uh, this was a, a question that uh, came through multiple times. Uh, how how uh, successful are compensatory curves uh, fixed uh, when you only do the main driving curve, either by a selective fusion or some type of tethering? Yeah. So compensatory curves, typically what we're talking about are curves that are really the primary curves in the thoracic region, and then there's a curve in the lumbar region. We've been doing studies on this and what we're finding is the most reliable way to get that lumbar curve in patients that truly have a primary thoracic curvature is with a fusion without a doubt. There are some patients that have tethers that are done just in the thoracic, but it again is just not as reliable as when these patients undergo fusion. Well, let's see, the next uh, slide. Oh, uh, let's go back one then. <clears throat> I mean, are there some other questions here that came through on the Q and A? Let me, uh, um, Merrick, going. This goes back to your bracing talk, but the WCR brace. Uh, are Are you familiar with it, and do you have any thoughts on it? Uh, I'm sorry, the WCR. Um, I am I, that's not. what it says here. 
Okay, no, maybe it's, it's the positive. wood wood Chinot Rigo. It's a variation oh, of the Rigo. Gotcha, gotcha. Yeah, the the Rigo Chinot brace um, really a lot of work done in Germany. Uh, we don't uh, offer it at our hospital, at least just yet. Uh, it really focuses much more on three dimensional correction. You know, we really have uh, continued to offer the Boston brace. Uh, because that's where the majority of um, the literature has been focused in on. But the Rigo Chanel, without a doubt, there's encouraging studies coming out. And, you know, to me, the most important thing is whichever, where, whichever brace you can get the best compliance with. But certainly the Rigo Chanel brace in combination with uh, scoliosis specific exercises can be a good option for, for patients. Uh, Amir, you, you, you talked about some pretty strict criteria for who's been uh, approved for a uh, tethering. Uh, what about the patient and the mother who's frustrated that their child is more mature and they have a mid 50 degree curve and they're just sort of petrified of having a fusion? Uh, what do you advise? I mean, sh should they just try tethering if they want? Should they, well, how would you advise that patient? So, you know, typically we do both tethering and, in fact, we still do more fusion surgery than we do tethering surgeries. And, uh, you know, we just go over what the pluses and minuses are of both procedure and oftentimes educate families that fusion is a good operation and it's a good option for the vast majority of curvatures that, uh, that we see in our practices. I, I think I have to give a little equal time to Dr. Lawner. Dr. Lon, did you hear that? I know you're, you're not, were well, you paying enough attention there? 58 degree curve, she's skeletally mature and the mother's upset that she missed the opportunity for a tether. What, what do you, how do you advise that patient? I was just uh, typing the response to another patient asking or family asking about the tether. But uh, I, I would say that this really has been the, the background research for this procedure was uh, done in uh, for immature patients, it was actually done first in, in, uh, in cows and, and, and pig models. And so uh, the case for this, the basis of this procedure is for growing patients first and foremost. I think um, doing this uh, procedure or offering this procedure in more mature patients, and I have done that in, on occasion in my practice, uh, I think is very much still um, uh, experimental and uh, will have to be studied carefully before we can recommend that routinely. Uh, how, how, Amir, um, I recently took a, a hundred patients that we had uh, that we had done spinal fusions on. They were indicated for surgery and we did spinal fusions. Then we applied the criteria for who would have been a candidate for a tether. And if you use those strict criteria, only 14 out of 100 or 14% would have qualified for a, a tether, but the vast majority of them would have also qualified for a selective thoracic fusion. That's what they ended up having. So it, it seems to me that the, the, the tether helps you the most in the thoracic spine where you need it the least and it helps you the least in the lumbar spine where you need it the most. Yeah, so, you know, Tom, actually, now that we've uh, done a lot of patients with lumbar tethers, I actually think it really shines, actually, in, in the lumbar spine. Well, that's interesting. Yeah, yeah, it, it's more of a recent development, Tom, now that we've, because we first started with the thoracic, absolutely, and now we've moved to the lumbar. And I remember early on, you had some great questions about the sagittal profile being in the front. I'll never forget, you know, are you going to compress it? watch that sagittal profile very closely, how the patients were doing from the side. And we have not seen them develop a lumbar kyphosis, i.e. an increase in their angle when you look at them from the side. Uh, Isn't I that really, technique driven? You learned how to do that not, right? That, that's technical, correct? Yes, I mean, there are some technical nuances where you place you know, the screws for the tether. The uh, big uh, uh, point is that what we found through our motion analysis studies that that's really where our focus is going to be is in those thoracal lumbar curvatures because I do feel that's where uh, there's the biggest benefit for the for the patient. Well, you've also br brought up the area that is the most challenging for how long it's going to last. 
yep. because there's a tremendous amount of motion in the lumbar spine. Yep. And orthopedics doesn't have a good track record in restraining motion across a mobile segment. You know, it just yeah. hasn't worked too well. L look at the ACLs, uh, prosthetic ACLs over time. But you're a neurosurgeon. I won't. I won't confuse you with that. No, no I mean, I think. I think it's all in the data. The nice thing is, we've now been doing it for 11 years. Uh, we have uh, several hundred patients that have had the lumbar tethers, and you know, we've got some uh, data. I think to really support uh, where it'll really shine and where it may not work as well. Excellent. Thank That's you. Discussion. I think it's time to wrap it up. Yeah. That last slide, please. I want to thank you all for attending. Uh, if you're grateful, please uh, consider uh, making a small, any, any size donation is appropriate for setting scoliosis straight. Uh, you can text scoliosis uh, or just get on the website. Uh, and we thank everyone for attending. And uh, it's a great, great camaraderie between uh, all of us on this call. Thank you for uh, uh, an excellent discussion. Yeah. Thank you to our sponsors as well. We wouldn't be here without them. Um, our next June 5th, we're having another one. David? Yes, the next one is going to be June 5th, 2021. Mark your calendars for the next Power Over Scoliosis webinar. Next. And once again, thanks to our sponsors. Um, please help us by answering a few survey questions that will pop up on your screen after this is over. Thanks again for joining us for this. And thanks for people who join later after this is, goes online. Thanks to all of our faculty. Take care, guys. Thank you. Thank you. Good night.